Defeat the rabbits. Defeat the rabbits. Oh. What did you have for breakfast? If you're watching in America, maybe you had pancakes, or in Japan, maybe a miso soup. I had my usual peanut butter on toast. We all need to eat because our food gives us energy, and today we're looking at how that energy gets to us humans through something called the food chain. Perfect. And now for the main course. A lovely bit of lobster. Whoa, whoa! Come back here, you sneaky crustacean! Whoa! Oh. Why, you little... Whatever your preference, pretty much all of the food you eat will have come from animals and plants. Animals like fish, chickens and sheep give us meat, but also things like eggs and milk. And plants don't only give us our fruit and vegetables, but also grains like wheat and rice that are used to make bread and pasta. Different countries eat different amounts of all the various food groups. For example, most people in India eat almost no meat, and more than half of the Vietnamese diet is grains. But whilst we all eat differently, it's all for the same reason. Us humans, like all animals, need to eat so that we can get energy. That energy allows us to move around and helps us to grow. If we didn't eat, we wouldn't last very long. So this energy is really important for keeping us alive and fit, like this fella. <laughs> the energy in our food come from? Well, believe it or not, for every bit of food that you put in your mouth, whether it's meat, fish, milk, fruit, veggies or grains, the energy originally came from the sun. That's right, the big bright thing in the sky. The sun emits energy in the form of light and heat. Back here on Earth, plants turn that light into sugar using a clever process called photosynthesis, which happens in the cells of the plant's leaves. The plant needs that sugar for the same reason we do, for energy, to stay alive and to grow. It can also store it quite literally for a rainy day. When the sun isn't shining, the plants can't make new sugar. Because they can make their own food, Plants are called producers. They produce food from light. But sadly for us, although the sunshine might make us feel good, humans and other animals can't trap light energy in the same way plants can. We can't make our own sugar, so we get our energy another way, by stealing it from plants. Because we eat plants for energy, we animals are called consumers. Some animals only eat plants. For example, sheep eat grass, crabs eat seaweed, and mice eat plants, fruits, and seeds. We call them herbivores, but they're also sometimes called primary consumers because they are the first animal to eat the plants. Like these guys. Ah, that should do it. You pesky rabbits again? Always eating my carrots. I'm gonna put a stop to this once and for all. All right, uh, yep, let's do that. Finished. I am a rabbit. Stop it. Hehehe. <laughs> stop the rabbits. Defeat the rabbits. I will no function. Feed the rabbits. Oh. When primary consumers like those pesky rabbits eat the plants, the sugar molecules that are stored in the leaves are broken down in the animal's body, releasing the sun's energy trapped inside. The animal will use that energy to stay alive and to grow. And just like a plant stores energy as sugar molecules inside its leaves, animals also store some of their energy as special molecules inside their own cells. Some animals don't eat plants though. They eat other animals instead. For example, a snake eats 
a mouse. The snake is a carnivore, and carnivores get their energy from those molecules the other animals stored in their body, which they got from the plants and the plants made from the sunlight. This creates what's known as a food chain. Plants, or producers, make the food. Herbivores, who are primary consumers, eat the plants, and carnivores eat the primary consumers, which makes them secondary consumers. The energy from the sun is first trapped by plants, then goes up the food chain to each animal. You can have more animals at the top here too. A carnivore that eats another carnivore, like a hawk that eats a snake, is called a tertiary consumer. Your food chain can't go on forever though. Every animal needs to eat the food that will give it enough energy to stay alive. The problem is that passing on energy from plants to animals to other animals isn't very efficient. Only a small amount of the energy, about 10%, gets passed on each time. So a patch of grass is able to turn about 10% of the sun's light energy into sugar. Mice eating that grass only get about 10% of the energy, and a snake eating the mice will only get 10% of that energy. By the time you get to the top, there's not much energy left. That means in a particular area, there are always fewer top carnivores than any other animal because there's less energy available to keep them alive. So these farmers better get their skates on. Oh, hi, Jerry. Hey, Bert. I'm just getting ready to plow my last crop of the year. I think you'll find that's my crop. It belongs to me. It's mine, and I'm on take it. Not if I plow it first. I got the horsepower to plow it first. I've got more horsepower than you. <laughs> Not against my plow, Master 3000. Call that a plow? This is a plow. Bert, look, it's Steve the Tortoise. Oh, hey, Steve. Did you catch the game with the way? Hey, that's my crop. Steve, that's I'm my taking cabbage. my crop. The food chain is dependent on the producers at the bottom. So if all the plants die, the animals that rely on them, either directly or indirectly, are also at risk. One way that animals can protect themselves from their food source disappearing is to eat more than one kind of food. A monkey will eat fruit, but also small animals too. Us humans eat a whole range of fruits and vegetables and different kinds of meats. An animal that is both a primary consumer eating plants and a secondary consumer eating other animals is called an omnivore. Having lots of different food sources means animals have options about where to get their energy from, and the food chains become joined up and crossed over into something called a food web, which could look something like this. Being part of a food web helps animals to survive because if one plant or animal dies out, they can eat something else. So when we're eating, say, a hamburger with bread made from wheat, beef from a cow, plus the lettuce, tomatoes, maybe a bit of mayonnaise, we're actually just keeping our options open as omnivores at the top of a huge food web. It's amazing to think about how all living things are connected by this flow of energy that started out in the sun. But can you guess what type of plant is the most important producer on the planet? It's not trees or grass, but algae. Tiny green plants that float around in the water. And they are at the bottom of all the food chains in the ocean. Tiny shrimp eat the algae, fish eat the shrimp, bigger fish eat the smaller fish, and so on and on. And because the seas are so big, there's lots of space for algae to grow and support some really big fish, like sharks. And while we're talking about big animals, did you know that the biggest creature that ever walked to the earth was a vegetarian. It was a long-necked sauropod dinosaur, and they could be taller than four double-decker buses stacked on top of each other. Huge animals need to eat a huge amount of food, so these dinos would have needed to chomp 1,000 pounds of leaves every single day, and that's about the same as 900 lettuces. Good evening and a welcome to Luigi's. Can I get... Oh. Okay, yes, no, we have that. A great choice, sir. There you go. Dinner is served. Whoa. 
Bon appetito! I would not be picking up their bill. So, we need to eat so that we can get energy to stay alive and to grow. That energy originally came from the sun and was trapped in sugar molecules by the plants. Those energy-rich molecules are passed up a food chain from producer to consumer, and food chains can be joined up into a food web when animals eat more than one kind of food. We're all part of a big interconnected network of energy. Now, all of this talking about delicious food has got me hungry. So, thanks for watching. Fireworks are the perfect way to celebrate pretty much anything, right? Birthdays, bonfire night, New Year. You can't go wrong with a few ooh and ah and some massive bangs in the sky and those are stunning colours and shapes. My favourites are the ones that burst with one colour and then burst again with another colour and go crackle. Yes. It's important though to remember that fireworks can be really, really dangerous. So you should always leave them to adults and professionals. And also keeping well back from a display won't just keep you safe, it'll mean you can see them more clearly. But did you know that fireworks have been around for more than a thousand years? They were invented in China in the ninth century and firework making was one of the most respected jobs around. Look after the factory whilst I'm away. No problem, I will. Do, 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 do. Oh, 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 I fell asleep. What time is it? Okay. Do, do, do. Ah. Hmm. Today, fireworks are so popular that there are even firework competitions held all over the world. So how do they actually work? Well, most of the big fountains of colour you see at a fireworks display come from one of these. It's called a shell, and it's launched from a tube like this, a mortar. But remember that they can be really dangerous, so if you find one, never touch it. Leave that to the professionals. This shell is empty but normally it would have everything inside that we need to make a bang high up in the air, followed by a flowery explosion of color and cracks and whistles. And this is what is inside that shell. It might look complicated, but every single thing plays a role in making the firework look and sound awesome. And it's down to some equally awesome chemistry. First up, we've got this part at the bottom. It's called the lift charge and it's made of gunpowder. Gunpowder is flammable, which means that when it comes into contact with enough heat, a chemical reaction called combustion takes place, which you might know of as burning. For combustion to happen, you need three things, fuel, oxygen, and heat. The chemicals in the gunpowder provide the fuel and the oxygen, and then the flame provides the heat. Have all three in the right combinations and you get combustion. That means producing a lot of gas, and then you've got that gas to thank for your whole firework display. The trick is to seal your gunpowder inside a container. As it burns, more and more gas is produced. The pressure increases inside the tube and the container breaks, releasing all that gas at once really, really fast in an explosion. When the fuse is lit, the flame travels all the way down 
Let's to the gunpowder in the lift charge. That explodes, all of that gas produced pushes against the bottom of the mortar and the rest of the shell is pushed up into the air at up to 200 miles an hour. As the firework is zooming up in the air, there's actually another fuse slowly burning, carrying the flame up and up and up into the middle of the shell here to the burst charge. When it's high in the sky, that burst charge is ignited. It contains gunpowder plus a different chemical mix called flash powder, which combusts even faster, making an even bigger explosion and a really loud bang. Have you noticed how sometimes they are so loud they can make your chest shake? When the burst charge explodes inside our firework, it sends everything else inside the shell out into the sky. That's where these little things come in. They're called stars. And when they're lit by the burst charge explosion, they leave brightly colored streaks across the sky and can give us the brilliant crackles and whistles that we sometimes get too. Inside each star is a mix of chemicals that provides the fuel and the oxygen you need for them to burn, plus a particular metal. Each metal gives a different colour flame, like strontium, which used to be used in old TVs. But when strontium is burned in a firework, it makes a red flame. Or you can use copper, the pipes that carry water and the wires that carry electricity through your house are probably made of copper. But when copper is burned in a firework, it makes a blue flame. Or a star might contain barium. Hey, uh, here's a joke. What do you do when a chemist dies? You bury him. Who doesn't love chemistry jokes? Just me? Barium is a metal that helps doctors x-ray your intestines. But when barium is burned in a firework, it makes a green flame. And if a firework contains a mix of different metals, you'll get a mix of different colours. You can even make shapes by arranging the stars carefully inside the shell, just like this smiley face. How cool is that? And um, where was the best firework display that you've ever seen? Tell us in the comments below. Now, you might be worried about how safe it is to burn all those chemicals up in the air. And you'd be right. While they won't harm you while you're watching, too much burning can lead to air pollution and climate change. For that reason, we don't set fireworks off all the time. And some firework displays are specifically designed to be carbon neutral. But did you know that the biggest ever firework weighed more than 2,300 pounds? That's about the weight of two grizzly bears. It traveled more than a kilometer up into the air and it exploded in a huge fountain of red sparks. I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> Welcome to my evil laboratory. <laughs> Igor, pour the gunpowder into the rocket. Yes, boss. Eureka! It is now time to fire the rocket. <laughs> oh, I must have miscalculated. Nice, grizzly bears. <laughs> So a firework is made up of some carefully chosen chemicals that undergo combustion when they're ignited. Gunpowder produces a lot of gas that lifts the firework off the ground. There's some flash powder inside to produce a big loud bang and a, a huge aerial explosion. And metal in the stars give us the wonderful colours and shapes. So when you next see a green firework, instead of saying ooh or ah, maybe shout barium! And your friends might look at you a little bit strangely, but then you can tell them a cool chemistry joke. If you can't helium or curium, 
then you'll have to bury them. Still nothing. Nothing. Oh, nice rat. Would you like some cheese? <laughs> Animals can do some incredible things, from changing their colour to blending with their environment, to surviving being totally frozen in ice. I love the weird and wonderful world of animals, so I thought today I could introduce you to some of my favourites. Right, let's start with one of the strangest looking animals out there, the anglerfish, which totally looks like something from an alien planet. They live more than 3,000 feet deep in the ocean, over half a mile. That's further down than the tallest skyscraper reaches up. When you go that deep, it gets really dark. You might think that water is see-through, but when you have 3,000 feet of it in the way, it does a great job of scattering the sunlight coming in from the surface, stopping it getting down very far. In fact, where anglerfish live, it's completely, utterly, totally pitch black. Ooh. But some, the females of the species, have their own torch. Hanging off an antenna that's attached to the very top of their head, there's a little light bulb on the end that glows in the deep darkness. But the bulb's light doesn't come from electricity like mine, but from bacteria that naturally glow in the dark. We say they are bioluminescent. The bacteria live inside the anglerfish's antenna, staying protected and getting a free meal whilst producing a spooky glow in return. The anglerfish doesn't use it to help see where it's going though. Instead, they use the light to lure other fish towards them. Out in the deep dark, a lonely fish sees a light glimmering in the distance. It could be a mate, it could be a bit of food. It swims towards it and then with a snap, the anglerfish strikes, trapping it with its huge cage-like teeth. Where was I? An anglerfish's teeth. So, on to some of the most ferocious in the animal kingdom, the ones that belong to crocodiles. They have over 60 super sharp teeth that are made for biting, not for chewing. In fact, crocodiles have the strongest bite of all the animals alive today. They can chomp down with a force of 3,700 pounds per square inch, which is nearly 20 times stronger than you or I can chew. And it's enough force to crush concrete into dust. It's all thanks to the incredibly powerful muscles in their cheeks. But here's the thing. The muscles that open their jaws are much, much weaker than the ones that close them. In fact, they're so weak that you could keep a crocodile's mouth closed with just your two hands. Although that's, that's not something I'd recommend trying. Oh, ho, ho. <sighs> Whoa! Oh. <sighs> Now, because crocodiles have dry, scaly skin and typically lay soft-shelled eggs on land, they're reptiles. But even though they breathe air, they spend most of their lives in the water. The next animal I want to introduce you to also lives in water, but isn't a reptile. It's a crab. And instead of having a skeleton inside its body like a crocodile, it has a hard outer shell called an exoskeleton. This makes crabs crustaceans. They have the amazing ability to both breathe in the air like us, but also underwater like fish. Crabs lay their eggs in the water, and some of them make a really big show of getting there. On Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean, there's one species of crab, creatively called the Christmas Island Red Crab, that travels from the forests to the beach once a year to mate. Every November and December, all the crabs travel to sea to lay their eggs, and by 
all the crabs. I mean, about 50 million of them all at the same time. There are so many of them scuttling from the forest to the sea that it looks like a giant moving red carpet. <laughs> Whatever next? Crabs? Wow! From sea to sewer, let's talk about rats. Rats are mammals like us humans because we give birth to live young too and then feed them milk to help them grow. But rats are one of the fastest reproducing mammals in the world. They can make lovely pets, but lots of people don't like wild rats. And that's maybe because they can increase their numbers so fast. Rats can start to have babies when they're just five weeks old. While our pregnancies last nine months, a rat will only be pregnant for three weeks. And when they give birth, they can have up to 14 babies, which is a lot. Each of those 14 babies is then ready to start having babies of their own in five weeks and the reproduction cycle begins all over again. If you do the maths, that means that one pregnant female rat could produce more than 250,000 rats in one year. Archie, not again, pesky rat. This means war. Hey! I got a new brand of cheese for you! Oh, gee! That wasn't supposed to happen! Oh! Nice rat! Would you like some cheese? <laughs> Giant rats would be quite scary, but what's even more terrifying is the thought of ferocious dinosaurs living among us. You might have heard that the monstrous terrible lizards that lived millions of years ago all died after a meteor impact. Well, in fact, not all of them did. After the meteor hit the Earth 65 million years ago, all the smoke and gas in the air made the planet very cold and dry. Most of the dinosaurs couldn't cope and died, but a few had adaptations that helped them survive the long winter, like feathers that acted like a warm coat, keeping the dino warm and toasty inside when it was freezing outside. Or hard beak-like mouths that could break through the tough outer shell of the nuts and seeds, which were one of the only food sources left after the icy conditions caused all of the plants to die. Descendants of dinosaurs with feathers and beaks. It sounds scary, right? Well, I reckon you will have seen one before, because I'm talking about birds. Yep, birds are actually the great, 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 great grandchildren of dinosaurs. Which means the closest living relative to the T-Rex is in fact the chicken. Happy birthday, Rex! We got party flowers, birthday cake, yay! Happy birthday, son, yeah. And presents! You're gonna love it, son. Oh. Uh. Huh? Hey, we got a visitor. Mark, do something! What do you want me to do? He's a chicken, we're related, he's part of the family. Hey, chicken, you eat as much cake as you like. Rex, say hi to your distant cousin. Did you enjoy finding out those fantastic animal facts? Which was your favourite? And do you know any awesome animal facts of your own? Let me know in the comments below. <laughs> what do you do with a big box of Lego bricks? Personally, I build a giant tower. which got me thinking about real skyscrapers. Could you make one out of Lego bricks? Stay tuned to find out. The first skyscraper was built in Chicago in 1885. It had a very glamorous name, the Home Insurance Building, and it was a whopping 10 storeys high. 
which might not sound like much now, but back then it would have seemed unbelievably huge. Today, the highest skyscraper is just a little bit taller. It's the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which has more than 160 floors and is over half a mile high, 20 times taller than that first one over 130 years ago. Okay, let's have a look then. Okay, 381, and perfect. The Empire State Building in New York is probably one of the most famous skyscrapers, and not just because of King Kong and his tape measure? It was the first building to have more than 100 stories and it was built incredibly fast, with builders completing almost a story a day. And a big hammer. Okay. Here you go. Whoa. finish with this. Uh, okay. <laughs> so how do such enormous buildings stay standing? Skyscrapers are amazing feats of engineering and the designers have to think carefully about the forces that will affect the building. Forces are pushes and pulls that can make an object move or squash or stretch and that's definitely not something we want our skyscrapers to be doing. There are two main forces that affect a really tall building. First up is gravity, or I should really say first down, because gravity pulls all things down towards the Earth. It's a vertical force and it comes from the weight of the building itself. When you have a big pile of stuff, like all the stuff in a skyscraper, gravity is pulling down on all of it, creating a lot of weight. Imagine being jumped on by a bunch of your friends. That's what it's like for the bottom floors of a tall tower. They have to be strong enough to stay standing under the weight of the rest of the building. The second force may be a bit of a surprising one, but it's basically this. It's a horizontal force caused by air resistance. In other words, the wind. Although you can't see it, the wind is made up of tiny molecules, all travelling in roughly the same direction. When you stick a big skyscraper in the way, the molecules run straight into the walls and get slowed down or knocked off in another direction. Every time a molecule bumps into the building, it gives the tiniest of pushes. So when you have trillions of them doing it all at once, it can add up to a big push. In fact, for really tall buildings, the horizontal force from air resistance is more than the vertical force from the building's weight. So, to keep standing, a skyscraper needs to resist these two forces. And to do that, the choice of building material is super important, as these guys know all too well. <laughs> Hello, little piggies. <gasps> You can't run away. What's happening there then? Yeah, you've got to choose your material carefully. You couldn't, for example, build a skyscraper out of marshmallows because all the marshmallows at the bottom would just get squashed flat from the weight of the other marshmallows on top. Houses are made out of bricks and they do a pretty good job. But if you stacked a load of houses on top of each other, the bricks at the bottom would break and crumble. So instead, modern skyscrapers are built out of steel and concrete. We say these materials have much higher compressive strengths, which means that they can be compressed a lot. They can take a huge amount of squeezing before they break or change shape. 
They also have higher flexural strengths, which means that they won't flex or bend when the wind applies a horizontal force. But how is that steel and concrete put together to make the tallest, safest and coolest looking skyscrapers? Well, in a house, the weight of the upper floors and the roof is supported by the walls. This is fine for a house, but with a tall skyscraper, the weight of the walls themselves can become too much for even the strong steel and concrete at the bottom to bear. So engineers come up with clever ways of lightening the load. Rather than solid walls, they make a kind of skeleton that can take the weight of the building, but not be too heavy itself. One of these types of skeletons is a steel frame. Big steel beams are used to make boxes. The steel handles those vertical and horizontal forces and then lighter materials, like glass, can be hung on the outside. Hey Tony, how's your carrot? <laughs> oh, my wife says I gotta watch my cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> Steel frames are strong and they're lighter than using solid walls, but the points where the beams join can be a weak point. Plus the need for supporting beams in the middle of the building means that your rooms inside can't be very big. A more recent skeleton type is something called a tube. Instead of having supports that run through the center of the building, in a tube they're only on the outside and the steel beams are closer to each other and they run up the full height of the building so it acts like a hollow cylinder. Fix that cylinder firmly in the ground with strong foundations and it does an amazing job at staying in one place no matter what forces you throw at it. Whoa. What? Oh. What's going on? <laughs> Many super tall buildings are built with this tube design these days, which lets them have huge open rooms on the inside and loads of glass windows giving an incredible view of the city below. So could we build a skyscraper out of Lego bricks? Well, the compressive strength of a Lego brick is surprisingly high. Scientists have worked out that you could build a stack of bricks more than two miles high before the one on the bottom squashes. That's almost four times higher than the Burj Khalifa. So what's the world record for the tallest Lego tower then? Well, it isn't quite that tall, it's just 115 feet, but that took more than half a million bricks. So imagine how many you'd need for it to go for two miles. Well, let's find out, shall we? Time to finish my massive Lego tower of epicness. I think we're gonna need um, a few more bricks, please. <laughs> that you scoundrels. <laughs> yeah, that's right. G'day, mate. Welcome to Australia. Volcanoes can be absolutely massive, but the biggest volcano we found isn't even on Earth. It's Olympus Mons on Mars, and it stands an incredible 16 miles high, more than three times the height of Earth's tallest mountain, Mount Everest. Back here on our home planet Earth, you can find about one and a half thousand active volcanoes, each capable of throwing out floods and fountains of scalding hot lava and smoke. An erupting volcano is such an awesome sight that when early civilizations saw them, they thought they were the homes of angry gods. <laughs> Oh. Ah. 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 
nowadays, we know that the impressive eruptions of these fiery mountains aren't the result of a godly temper tantrum, but rather the release of huge amounts of heat and pressure from deep beneath the Earth's surface. If you were to slice the Earth in two, you'd see that it's a bit like an onion with several different layers on top of each other. But as it's nearly 8,000 miles thick, it might take a while. On the top here, you have the crust. That's the hard rock we walk around on. And the oceans, they sit on top of that too. And beneath the crust is a thick layer of solid rock called the mantle that's so hot it's a bit like really thick treacle. It flows like a liquid, but very, very slowly. And then further in, it gets even hotter. And the next layer, the outer core, is made up of liquid iron. When you finally get to the centre, there's an inner core of hot, solid iron. <laughs> Oh, tiring work. Oh, hello, Fenton. What are you doing? Oh, oh, but I'm supposed to be digging the hole. <laughs> that you scoundrels. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. G'day, mate. Welcome to Australia. The scientists have worked out that the temperature in the centre of the Earth is really high, about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the sizzling core acts like a hot plate underneath a pan of boiling water. The lower part of the mantle that's in contact with the core heats up. And because it can flow like a really thick liquid, it slowly rises towards the top. When it gets there, it's got nowhere left to go, so spreads out sideways. Now it's away from that hot core, it cools down a bit, which makes it sink back towards the center of the Earth. This movement in the mantle is called a convection current, and it has an interesting effect on the crust layer above it. The Earth's crust isn't one solid piece. It's broken up like a jigsaw into pieces called tectonic plates. When the flow of hot mantle rock spreads out, it pushes those plates around and they bump and crash into each other and things get really exciting. When the plates grind together, that produces tons of heat, which can melt the solid rock into something called magma. More and more grinding makes more and more magma, and it builds up in pockets deep under the ground called magma chambers. The walls around the magma chambers are solid rock. They can't exactly stretch to make more space for the increasing amounts of magma inside. So the pressure keeps building and eventually, well, let me show you. I'm going to demonstrate all this with my model volcano. This bit in here is the magma chamber. Now, rather than heat and rocks in the Earth's crust, I'm going to put in some vinegar with a bit of red food coloring and baking soda. And this is all going to produce a lot of gas and foam, which will be our model magma. A little bit safer than using actual molten rock, but just like in a real magma chamber, the pressure is going to build and build and it's got to find a way to escape. So let's try it. Right, first things first, I'm going to put in our vinegar. Here it goes into the magma chamber. And next goes in the baking soda. And let's wait to see what happens. I can hear it fizzing inside the magma chamber. And now we wait. Oh! <laughs> We've got an eruption! Oh, look at that! So already, that high pressure magma eventually finds the easiest way out through cracks in the rock. And when it's out, it changes its name. When it's inside, the molten rock is called magma. When it's outside, it's called lava. The lava flows out, this is awesome, like it's doing right now, and it cools in the air. It forms a huge pile of solid rock that we call a volcano. But different types of lava can make different types of eruptions. Some are smoky, some are gassy. <laughs> What's that gas in the air that seems to be knocking everyone out? Is that the volcano? No.
That's just Terry. He's eating all the sausages. Hello? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Runny lava will find its way through cracks easily, so not much pressure builds up before it pours out all over the surface like a flood, creating a wide volcano with shallow slopes like on Hawaii. But a stickier lava can't flow as easily, and it builds up lots of pressure before it escapes. That will make an explosive eruption with huge ash clouds producing steep-sided volcanoes like Mount Fuji in Japan. If there's too much pressure in the magma chamber, the volcano can even destroy itself when it explodes, like Mount St. Helens in the USA. In whatever way they happen, volcanic eruptions are an impressive sight, but some of the biggest have had a long-lasting effect on the environment and human history. The surprise eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Italy, nearly 2,000 years ago, buried the entire town of Pompeii in ash, preserving the Roman culture perfectly for archaeologists to discover much later. And right now, the pressure is building in a gigantic magma chamber underneath Yellowstone National Park in America. We don't know when it will erupt, but when it does, we reckon it'll be a big one. So much so, it will get the title of being a super volcano. Just doesn't seem to be cooking on this fire. How? Hmm. Hmm. So, volcanic eruptions happen because the Earth's core is hot, which creates convection currents in the mantle, moving around the tectonic plates, causing them to melt when they bump into each other. That hot rock builds up in magma chambers until the pressure is too much and the magma escapes, becoming lava that cools to make a volcano. There are more than seven and a half billion people in the world, and each and every one is totally unique. No matter how hard you look, you won't find someone with exactly the same features as you, even if you're an identical twin. Ow! <gasps> huh? It's, it's like, like looking in a mirror. mirror. Oh my, there's, there's so, so much, much to, to talk, talk about. about. Uh, 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 fraud. Have you ever wondered why you got the features you did? How come I have blue eyes and blondish hair, whilst other people might have brown hair or brown eyes or a beard or no hair at all? It's all down to something called genetics. 200 years ago, scientists believed that the effect of things you did during your life would be passed on to your children. For example, they thought that giraffes got their long necks because they had to stretch to get their food at the top of trees, and that mothers would then pass that long neck characteristic on to their children. Then, when they grew up, they would stretch their necks even more and give birth to babies that grow up and have even longer necks. It's a good idea but we now know that it isn't true. If it was, the babies of tattooed bodybuilders would be born with tattoos and huge muscles. It actually took a surprisingly long time for scientists to figure out how we pass our characteristics onto our children, something that's known as inheritance. If you used a microscope to zoom really close down into your skin, you'd see that it's made of little pockets called cells. Every living thing on Earth bigger than a bacteria is made up of these tiny cells. Our bodies contain trillions of them, and inside each one there's a command centre called the nucleus. Inside that nucleus are the instructions for making not just another cell, but a whole body. 
the instructions are written in code using something called DNA. And every single person has a different DNA code. It's the unique instruction manual for making another you. If all those instructions were written out like Lego building guides, then your instruction manual would be about one million pages long. And your body has that in pretty much every single cell. Isn't that incredible? Inside your personal instruction manual, there are separate sections for each different feature, like eye colour, hair colour, how tall you are, pretty much everything else that makes you, you. Those sections are called genes. We humans have about 24,000 genes in every cell, and we get our genes from our biological parents. Everyone starts out as two special cells that need to come together to make a baby. A woman's egg and a man's sperm. That man and woman are known as your biological parents. The egg and sperm meet and fuse together in a process known as fertilization. And that makes the first cell of a baby. That one cell then splits over and over and over again until it makes the trillions in your body. But they all came from that first one. The sperm and egg cells each carry a copy of the man and woman's DNA. So when they combine, that first cell and all the cells that come from it have two copies of the instructions, two copies of each gene. But if there are two copies of the instructions, how does a cell decide which copy to read? Well, some instructions are more powerful than others. Let's take hair colour as an example and look at brown hair versus blonde hair. The most powerful gene, what we call the dominant gene, is the one for brown hair. Imagine it as shouting louder. The blonde hair variety is quieter, what we call recessive. This means if you get a set of instructions from your mum, which includes the DNA code for brown hair, and a set of instructions from your dad, which includes the DNA code for blonde hair, brown shouts louder, and you're likely to have brown hair. But how does someone get blonde hair? Well, because the gene for blonde hair is recessive, it will only be read when there isn't a dominant brown gene shouting louder. To get blonde hair, you need both your genes for hair colour to be blonde. So if both biological parents have blonde hair and they both give a blonde hair gene to their baby, then the baby can have blonde hair. The really cool thing about this DNA and inheritance is that features can actually skip generations and a baby can be born with a feature that neither of its biological parents have. Okay. I can do this. I can do it. I can do this. <laughs> hey horse, are you serious? <laughs> Gonna win this one, Grandpa. I'm faster than a lightning bolt. Don't oh, catch me! Grandma! Don't give up! I win! The winner! <laughs> Maybe it doesn't work exactly like that, but a baby can be born with blonde hair, even though both of its parents have brown hair. Even though two parents might both have brown hair, they could be carrying the recessive blonde hair gene quietly sat there. But if they both end up giving the blonde hair gene to the baby, the baby will have blonde hair as if from nowhere. It's random chance which copy of the genes a baby will get, which is why you end up looking similar to, but not exactly the same as, your biological parents and your brothers and sisters. But inheritance is obviously not just about blonde and brown hair. There are 24,000 genes in your DNA code and they interact together, making you totally unique. 
Unlike the scientist who thought that a giraffe stretching its neck would make the necks of its babies longer, we now understand that the things we do during our lives aren't passed on to our babies, because stretching your neck to reach the tasty leaves doesn't affect the DNA instruction manual in our cells. So this scenario is unlikely. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Howdy, little one. You in there? Yo, where's my little dudes? All right. Inheritance of genes works the same whether you're a human, a monkey, or a plant. But there are a few living things that do things a little differently. Some plants clone themselves, making a new individual by simply just copying all their instructions. Bananas do this. Every banana you eat is actually a clone. If you looked at the instructions inside the cells from a hundred different bananas, they'd all be identical. And it's not just plants. Another famous clone was Dolly the sheep. In 1996, Dolly was the first and only animal to be cloned, meaning she wasn't just a bit like her mother. Her DNA was exactly the same. <coughs> Oh, come on! Hey! Ow! Must be a problem with the wave configurator. Ah. I think I know how I can... What? Oh, no! Ah. Oh, dear. <laughs> so, unless you're a clone, you will look like your biological parents because you inherit the instructions for making your body from them. You get a random selection of gene types from both of them though. And because some are dominant and some are recessive, you can actually end up with features that even your parents don't have. However, because you have thousands of genes that interact and you can change how you look through your life, you'll always be unique. Now, I wonder if I can make a minifigure as unique as me.